I thought with one or two lighter interludes it might be useful. Uh, can you hear me, Father? Yes, sir. If I talked about what I would like to call uh, the grammar of worship. In other words, what it really means to be worshipping. I mean, for example, is worship in order to instruct us? Is it, is it, do we do it in order to make ourselves or to invite God to, by his merciful grace, to make us better? Do we? I often feel this is what people believe when people speak to you after you've been celebrating liturgically and they come up to you afterwards and say, that was a lovely mass, Father. Um, that, and, and people ask you, was it successful? How did it go this morning? I mean, you feel like saying, well, I presume God accepted the holy sacrifice, but I have no direct means of verifying that. Um, what is worship really for? The grammar of worship. And later in the week, uh, if God preserves us, I hope to talk about the Bible, the grammar of the Bible. Because among all the crises that the Catholic Church seems to be enjoying itself with at the moment, indeed, you might wonder if the Catholic Church was as enthusiastic about a crisis-ridden existence as the Anglican Communion has been for the last two or three generations. It seems to me that the unnoticed, unspotted, undiagnosed crisis is that concerning the Bible, which has been so ever since the modernist controversies at the beginning of the 20th century and through all the way through the encyclical Divino Aflante Spiritu right down to the present. But that, um, as I say, if God preserves us all, I, I plan for, for later in the week. Today, um, the grammar of worship, or as a subtitle, how does the liturgy, or how should the liturgy, form us as Christians? And because I have scant confidence in my own ability, cleverness, or whatever, I make no apology for the fact that I intend to quote other people quite a lot. And I'd like to begin by quoting something that I did, in fact, read uh, this morning after the, after the Gospel of Mass, uh, a passage from Blessed John Henry Newman whom, of course, I am obliged to think well of because he is the patron of the Ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham and Blessed John Henry Newman, into which I am incarnated, and to which, culturally, I am very much an enthusiastic member. But this passage has been a very important one to me long before the Ordinariates became a twinkle in Pope Benedict's eye. It's a passage which shows a young man who has become a Catholic, um, Willis, being attacked because of the, f the unreasonable character of the Mass. Do tell me, just tell me, how can you justify the Mass as it's performed abroad? How can it be called a reasonable service when all parties conspire to gabble it over as if it mattered not a jot who attended to it or even understood it? Speak, man, speak, says Bateman, shaking Willis's shoulders. And in the course of, I won't repeat it all from this morning, but in the course of Willis's answer, there is this which I think is very emotional. I suggested this morning that uh, Newman here is putting into the mouth of a, a character within his narrative something that he himself feels deeply because it's so emotionally put that he would have been embarrassed to say it in his own person, so to speak, in propria persona, so he puts it into the mouth of a protagonist in a drama. It's not only emotional, however. This has a profound theological, no, I would say philosophical uh, truth to it, which 
has actually raised its head in philosophical circles uh, with the Cambridge philosopher Catherine Pickstock in more recent years. Anyway, this is how... I won't read the whole of what I read. Oh, it's, 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 no, no. It's is it? <laughs> well, I will go with that. <laughs> yes. How can... How, um, they, they gabble it over. Um, uh, they, 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 they don't care whether I understand it or not. Speak, man, speak. These are difficult questions, answered Willis. Must I speak? Such difficult questions, he continued, rising into a more animated manner and kindling as he went on. I mean, people view them so differently. It is so difficult to convey to one person the idea of another. Here's something I left out this morning. And I'll come back to that. But I think this, is it. This, this bit is important. The idea of worship is different in the Catholic Church from the idea of it in your church. For in truth, the religions are different. Don't deceive yourself, my dear Bateman, he said tenderly. It is not that ours is, is, is your religion carried a little bit further, a, a little too far as you would say. No, they differ in kind, not in degree. Ours is one religion, yours another. If I wanted to be really provocative, I would say that the same sort of distinction might be made between the worship which emerged from the spirit of Vatican II in the late 1960s and the uh, worship of the Catholic Church uh, in a millennium and a half before that, but I don't wish to be provocative, so I won't say that. He goes on. I declare to me, he said, and he clasped his hands on his knees and looked forward as if soliloquizing. To me, nothing is so consoling, so piercing, so thrilling, so overcoming as the Mass said as it did among us. I could attend Masses forever and not be tired. It is not a mere form of words. It is a great action, the greatest action that can be on earth. It is not the invocation merely. But I, if I dare use the word, the evocation, the, the calling out of the eternal. He becomes present on the altar in flesh and blood, before whom angels bow and devils tremble. This is that awful event which is the end and is the interpretation of every part of the solemnity. This is the bit that I'm philosophically interested in. Words are necessary, but as means, not as ends. They are not mere addresses to the throne of grace. They are instruments of what is far higher, of consecration, of sacrifice. What, as I said a, a moment or two ago, what are words really for? Are words for the communication of information. Well, of course, sometimes words are for the communication of information. Indeed, the point I'm making is not that they are or that they're not. The point that I'm making, the point that I think Newman was making, is that there are many different purposes for words. Words are used in many different ways. And the games, if those of you who've done philosophy have um, Wittgenstein here, you, you, you will recognize something of what I'm saying. Um, the games that are being played by language in different contexts are, are very different games. They can convey information. On the British railways at the moment, a voice keeps coming over the, the system, and, and it says, the safety, the safety information is located adjacent to the door. And every time I hear that, I think to myself, why don't they just say the safety information is by the door? What does it add to say is located adjacent? Sorry, I'm wool gathering again. I apologize for these constant digressions, which are the work of the devil within me. Uh, words can be for the imparting of information. But they can be other things. 
When a priest pours water over some little object that the godmother or the mother is holding over the, over the font, and he says, I baptize you, he's not giving you information about what he's doing. He's not saying, look, folks, um, uh, I, I, I'm baptizing it. It's what the Oxford philosopher of the last generation, J.L. Austin, called a performative. In other words, the words, together with the action, the words actually do it. It's the words and the pouring of the water that actually do incorporate the little thing that the lady is holding into the body of Christ, cleanse it from original sin, and make it a child of God. <laughs> a performative. Take a Lord Chief Justice in the High Court, or his equivalent in the Four Courts in Dublin. Uh, he gets up in the morning, he loses his temper with his wife, and he says, you be hanged. Later in court, let's consider ourselves as being three or four generations ago, if he passed sentence of death over a convict, it would be words that really meant basically the same. You are to be taken from this place and hanged till you be dead. But that's a performative. It puts the person concerned into the state of being somebody sentenced to death. It doesn't have the same effect as saying to your wife when you lose your temper, you be, you be hanged. When a priest says, I absolve you from your sins, that, again, is a, is a performative. It's not a description. If anything, it's not conveying inf information. It may convey information. Um, the person being absolved may be glad to hear that he's being absolved, but the real point of it is to absolve the person to forgive their sins, because that is what the Lord promised to the ministry of his priests. Newman is saying that that's how we should think of the words within the Holy Eucharist. They are not there for any other purpose than to do something. The Eucharist is an objective truth. When Mass is offered, the body and blood of the incarnate Word are offered to the Eternal Father as a propitiatory sacrifice. And the words, the words of the canon of the Eucharistic prayer, are what do that. They are what take bread and wine, transform them, and then offer them to the Father. It's not done for education. It's not done for uh, formation. It's not done for information. It's done to sacrifice. Just as in pagan cult. When the bull was dragged up to the altar and the assistants of the priests took the axe and crashed the axe down on the neck of the bull being sacrificed, it was the axe that performed the sacrifice. So in the sacrifices of the new dispensation, in the Holy Eucharist, it is the words which effect the sacrifice. I'm going to read to you a fair bit from a lady called Christine Moorman. If some of you have occasionally read my blog, you may have noticed that I do from time to time do that sort of thing. But first of all, I want to read a bit from a person, and again, here I am being provocative, whom I've never liked, the late Mr. Wordsworth. I've never liked his attitude to poetry, and particularly his attitude to language. This is what he says. This is Lyrical Ballads. <clears throat> 
mumble, 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 a few words concerning the, the origin of the phraseology which I have condemned under that name. The earliest poets of all nations generally wrote from passion excited by real events. That's Wordsworth's, that's the romantic theory of language and poetry, isn't it? They wrote naturally and as men feeling powerful as they did, their language was daring and figurative. In succeeding times, poets and men ambitious of the fame of poets, perceiving the influence of such language and desirous of producing the same effect. And anyway, so it goes on. He concludes, the first poets, as I have said, spake a language which, though unusual, was still the language of men. He claims that the first poets wrote simple language, passionately inspired by their strong emotions. How he knows that, I'm not quite sure, because he can't have been around when all these primitive poets, such as, as Homer or whatever, uh, two or three thousand years previously were there to hear. No, of course he doesn't. It's all a theory, and it's part of the modern superstition and fetish of simplicity, which I hope to refer to in another context tomorrow. If we want sophistication, we should, in my view, turn from a facile fantasist like Wordsworth, we should turn to a Dutch classicist called Christine Moorman, a very good classicist, uh, somebody who wrote vast amounts, but all of it worth its weight in gold, who ought to have been one of the most important writers in the Catholic Church in the 20th century, were it not for the fact that she wrote at the wrong time, when all the ecclesiastical and, more important, liturgical fashions were going in the opposite direction. And by the time I have finished quoting from Professor Mormon, you'll, you'll see why. I do apologize she doesn't intersperse her argument. Um, women scholars tend not to. She doesn't intersperse her arguments with constant quips and funnies. And if your eyes were to glaze over, then that would be understandable. But, um, dear friends, reverend fathers, um, uh, she is worth listening to. And after all, in seven and a half minutes, you can get a sort of digest of her from me relatively painlessly. If one wishes, this is the beginning of her book on the beginnings, the origins of Christian Latin. If one wishes to study the phenomenon of sacred and hieratic languages, one must first rid himself of the still widespread conception that the only function of human language is that of communication. In other words, that language only serves to make known as clearly and efficiently as possible that which the speaker wishes to convey to the hearer. From this, one might conclude that the most perfect language would be a linguistic system which, with the help of the fewest possible words and other linguistic aids, would provide the clearest possible means of communication. And to leave on a bit, she says, a language is not merely a sort of code to facilitate intercourse between human beings in daily life. It's not that. I think, indeed, women might understand that better than men. Men tend to use language more than women, I think, to convey information. If a man says uh, the window is open, he might just mean that the window is open. If a woman says the window is open, she means, I don't think you love me enough to realize that I'm rather cold. Um, uh, one, one has to be aware of the different linguistic uh, functions of male language and female language. C.S. Lewis, whom you will discover I tend also to quote quite often, once said that you can't have a situation in which men and women are both collaborating in a kitchen at the same time. 
because a man would say to another man, men can work in kitchens, and so can women separately, work in kitchens. but a, a man will say to another man, uh, would you please put this uh, saucepan inside the larger saucepan which you'll find inside the green cupboard? A woman will say, put this one in that one over there. And that's why communication uh, between the genders is basically um, impossible. Sorry, I've digressed again. The phenomenon of language is infinitely more complicated and has many more functions than that of communication among people. And she quotes mid 20th century um, philologists such as Saussure and Bali, especially, have already pointed out that language by no means serves only to communicate actual facts, but is also the interpreter of all the motions and workings of the human mind, and above all, of human sensibility. Language is also a medium of expression. Whereas, as we have seen, language used merely as a means of communication strives towards a certain degree of efficiency, etc., etc. Language as expression usually shows a tendency to become richer and more subtle. Wordsworth preferred simple language. Murman points out that life isn't as facile as that. It aims at becoming, by every possible means, more expressive and more picturesque, and it may try to attain this heightened power of expression, both by the coining of new words and by the preservation of antiquated elements, already abandoned by the language as communication. Thus, language as expression also serves the cause of linguistic art. Expression can have various aims. The establishing of contact between one person and another, of one man with himself, of, of man with God. Prayer considered from a linguistic point of view usually lies more within the domain of expression than in that of communication. And she talks about the beginning of liturgical Latin. The fact that this Latinizing process began comparatively late, at a time when the Christian communities were to a large extent consolidated, explains why early Christian Latin, as we find it in the comparatively rare texts of the second and the first part of the third centuries, appears from the very beginning as a linguistic variant bearing all the signs of being the differentiating language of a closed group. In other words, Christian Latin developed by doing the sort of jobs that need to be done within a group that is, as it were, closed off from the rest of the world, from the, from the outside world. The Christians only succeeded very slowly, and then only in part, in breaking loose from the classical literary tradition. In my opinion, this rigid traditionalism is one of the reasons why liturgical Latin developed so late. Then here comes a good bit. I mean, it's all good, but this is even better, I think. The moulding of a hieratic language. And from their tradition, the Romans were more familiar with the phenomenon of sacral languages than any other people in antiquity. Demands a power of stylistic creation, which the first Christian centuries in the West clearly did not possess. She's building up a quite amazing picture. I think particularly amazing to those who think that a vernacular liturgy is simply something that means going back to what the early Christians did. They understood Latin. When people no longer understand Latin, then you translate the liturgy into a language that they do understand would be a not, I think, inaccurate way of describing many modern assumptions. Mormon is making the point that the liturgy was not translated from Greek into Latin in Rome until the Roman Christians had invented an extremely artificial, old-fashioned dialect of Latin into which to translate it. It is in the second half of the fourth century that Rome proceeds to a complete Latinization of the liturgy. From time immemorial, 
the Romans had been accustomed to a very archaic cult form in which the prayer texts had sometimes become incomprehensible even for the priests who had to pronounce them. That's the old pagan priests of the pre-Christian Roman religion. And she is arguing that the early Roman Christians deliberately formed their Christian language of worship along those archaic lines, those old-fashioned, deliberately old-fashioned lines. As long as the early Christian idiom had not reached its full development, that time was not yet ripe. The means did not yet exist for creating a hieratic style. It is possible for a language such as she describes to arise in the second half of the fourth century. And so she has described how the early Roman sacral tradition, mingled with biblical stylistic elements, had taken on a strongly hieratic character, widely removed from the Christian colloquial language. Liturgical Latin was not everyday speech. It was not uh, what you read in your, in your tabloid newspaper. And she quotes St. Hilary. Non in secundum sermonis nostri usum promisquam in his apported esse facilitatem. There is no place here for the loose facility of the colloquial language. And she goes on, this is her, not me, the advocates of the use of the vernacular in the liturgy. She was writing in the 1950s when these things were bubbling up but hadn't happened. The advocates of the use of the vernacular in the liturgy who maintain that even in Christian antiquity the current speech of everyday life was employed are far off the mark. The language was far removed from that of everyday life. The rare poetic element has likewise its own style. May I remark at this point that the canon of the Mass, the most sacred part of the liturgy, is also the most rigidly stylized. And she goes on, a paragraph later, let us begin by casting a glance at the style of the Roman canon of the Mars. And a bit later, she sums it up like this. And those of you who use it daily will recognize what she says. The rhythmically balanced flow of words shows an almost juridical precision. Juridical. It's almost like something you would read in an Act of Parliament. Um, it's something that you might read in a judgment handed down by a court. She talks about monumental verbosity, and she doesn't mean verbosity in the way that we would use it perhaps nowadays to be insulting. She simply means much use of words, much enjoyment of the use of words. This monumental verbosity coupled with juridical precision. She says it suits the gravitas romana, the Roman gravity. She goes on to quote some of the very ancient pre-Christian prayers which make this point. A thing that a, that a farmer says for the lustration of his fields, a Roman general uh, besieging uh, a city who would beseech the gods of that city to leave, I pray and beseech you, notice the duplication, as in the canon we might take supliches rogamus ac petimus, so here precor veneror, I beg and beseech you, uh, the general asks for uh, forgiveness, he asks that um, the gods of that city will leave it, that they will desert it, that they will desert all the places in it, all the temples in it, all the sacred places, the city itself, and go away and depart and leave constant repetitions, as you see, from it. It's very much the style of the Roman canon. The same wealth of words, says Professor Mormon, the same parallelism, the same alliteration and rhyme, the same juridical precision. A sacral style has been created which links up with the old Roman prayer of the official Roman cult. 
Roman sobriety deliberately avoided the exuberance of certain Eastern prayer styles, which actually exerted an influence on Christian liturgy in the East. And later in the week, I hope just to dip into an example of that from the liturgy of St. James. Thus we see that in the style of the canon of the Mass, the Roman liturgy has created something very special and unique, a remarkable combination of Romanitas and Christianitas, which throughout the centuries will retain, will remain its, its chief characteristic. Deliberate sacral stylization of Christian Latin. As regards the plea, which we so often hear for vernacular versions of the prayer texts, I think from a purely theoretical point of view, and I am here dealing only with theoretical considerations, that we are justified in asking whether at this present time the introduction of the vernacular into the liturgy would not mean more loss than gain. You see why she was not the favorite read of many of the theorists and so-called liturgists of the middle part of this century. First and foremost, there is the question of whether or not the vernacular style would be suitable for the composition of a sacral prayer style. She doesn't think that the vernacular is necessarily wrong. She thinks that it would be possible for modern European languages to have a sacral style. And indeed, the Roman instruction Liturgiam Authenticam of a few years ago expressed a hope that that would indeed happen. But Christine Mormon is convinced that when at least she wrote, it had not done so. From this, for this, I must return to what I said at the beginning. The language used in the prayers of the church in which the believer, the individual believer, takes part lies not so much in the realm of communication as in that of expression. The otherness of language, Christian, Greek, and Latin, was designed to be different from everyday language because that's what, because what, what they do is not what, what everyday language does. Different types of language, different types of words for, 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 for different linguistic usages. Words are not used, as Newman put it, in the Eucharist as they are in uh, normal human words. Um, the liturgies of East and West are designed to perform the sacrifice without there being any concern uh, with interaction. And uh, Evelyn War, an English novelist, uh, a convert to the church, a convert who was very disquieted with the liturgical changes of the 1960s, wrote this. When I first came into the church, I was drawn not by the splendid ceremonies, but by the spectacle of priest as craftsman. He had an important job to do, which none but he was qualified for. He and his apprentice, I think that means the server, he and his apprentice stumped up to the altar with their tools and set to work without a, a glance to those behind them, still less with any intention to make a personal impression upon them. As the Anglican liturgical, the Anglican liturgical Benedictine and scholar um, Dom Gregory Dix made, made the point that uh, the Eucharist is just as much the Eucharist celebrated in St. Peter's in Rome in the presence of 500 bishops and no more so than it is when celebrated by Charles de Foucault alone in his hermitage in the desert. Ultimately, you don't need people, people there. Ultimately, I say ultimately because, of course, you hope to have people there. Ultimately, however, they're not necessary. You do need to have, if you're a pastor, your people there because they need what only the Eucharist has. But ultimately, the Eucharist happens, even if there's nobody there but the priest. And 
war was not impressed by the new liturgies of the 1960s in which a priest smirked at him over the altar. And I read the other day an objection by somebody to the way that communion is given in many Catholic churches nowadays where the person giving communion apparently sometimes they're taught to do this in their training courses is invited to uh, look in the eyes of the person communicating and to smile at them I think that shows at the absolute epitome of what sacramental worship is not. Set to work without a glance to those behind them, still less with any intention to make a personal impression upon them. Byzantines, of course, would understand this. In the Byzantine rite, there is even a convenient thing called an icon screen to prevent the people from watching the craftsman at his job, at his altar, with his apprentice and his tools. Actuosa participatio is a phrase that's been much heard since the council. I think it actually goes back to the uh, beginning of the century with trale solicitudine, doesn't it? But uh, actuosa, active participation, was one of the, the bywords that reverberated around in the 1960s. But I put it to you, brethren and reverend fathers, that authentic participation means participating in what any action really is. For example, if you go to watch a film, actuosa participatio is watching the film. If you started getting up and dancing, that would not be an appropriate way of participating actively in the watching of film. Similarly, if you went to a dance and you expressed a desire to watch a film, sit down and watch a film instead, that would not be actuosa participatio in, in dancing. They're different things. A parliamentary debate is not the same as, uh, as, uh, as a wine tasting. A wedding breakfast is not the same as, um, as a, a lecture on astrophysics. Uh, digging the garden is not the same as washing your hair. Different actions are, it's so obvious, isn't it? Different actions are different from each other. And so if you want to participate in any one thing authentically, actuosa participatio, if you want to do this authentically, you have to know what the action actually is that you are partaking in. And you see where I'm going for. Participating in Mass in a way that isn't proper to the Holy Eucharist isn't actuosa participatio. It's not the authentically proper way of doing that authentic action. St. Paul knew this. Um, I don't really commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you assemble as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. I partly believe it. For there must be factions in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you meet together, it's not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal, and one is hungry and another is drunk. In other words, he's saying very clearly that you've got to understand what the action is that you're taking part in. If you're taking, in the, taking part in the Kudiakon Depnon, the Lord's Supper, then one sort of behavior is called for, which is going to be different from the sort of behavior that's called for if you're at a, at a, at a secular, as it were, supper party. They were eating, they were drinking, and they were getting drunk. They were, those Corinthian Christians who caused him so much trouble, 
they were actively participating in something which was not the Eucharist because they didn't understand what was going on. Each goes ahead, prolambanatai, with his own supper. And uh, to take up what he says a bit later on, etc., mumble, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. If you get your understanding of what you're taking part in wrong, then your actuosa participatio is actually disastrous and according to St. Paul can involve your damnation. The Bible puts things so strongly, doesn't it? I mean, we are reasonable 21st century men. We wouldn't put it strongly like that, would we? We'd, 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 we'd tone it down a bit and say um and ah a bit, wouldn't we? Uh, it's quite diverting, however, isn't it, to go back to the biblical language and to see just how improper uh, the biblical writers were, how unpastoral they were, and, uh, and, and all that sort of thing. Actuosa participatio is based on discerning diacrino, and in Paul's Greek, what is happening. May I put before you two possible imaginary vignettes? Imagine an illiterate peasant in 18th century Sicily. Hmm, perhaps they weren't all illiterate. Should one typecast people? Allow me just to make a point to do some pretty improper typecasting. An illiterate peasant in 18th century Sicily attending mass, saying nothing, understanding not a word of the Latin, but knowing that when the priest prays silently after the sanctus and the boy rings the bell, that the Lord is coming to his people. And when the priest lifts up the host above the altar, the peasant looks up and worships and says in his heart, My Lord and my God. Imagine that. Here's the second of the two imaginary vignettes I put before you. I'm sure this never happens. Imagine a modern liturgical event. Everybody has a job to do. Some ladies are uh, readers. Some ladies are extraordinary ministers. Uh, many ladies are, in fact, both. Indeed, as the priest says the words of the Lord, this is my body. The choir is because it wishes to be properly active, oh, and, and, and it's got to, uh, it, it, it got to seeing the, the acclamation soon after the consecration, hasn't it? While the priest is saying the verba domini, the choir is shuffling its paper, its papers, it's, it, it's getting ready to sing, to sing the acclamation, which the 1960s decided had got to be put into the middle of the Eucharistic prayer. Well, you know what I am going to say, uh, brethren and uh, and Reverend Fathers, don't you? It is my view that number one is genuine, authentic, active participation, actuosa participatio. Or take a Greek, an ordinary Greek parish church, which I some modest amount of, of knowledge. People are drifting in and out at different times. They don't all have to be there at the beginning. They don't all sing hymns together, as in the regimented Protestant and post-Protestant West. Uh, you come in and you go to the, uh, you, you, you venerate first the icons on the royal doors, don't you? And then you might wander around the church, oh, having a word with Mrs. Bloggs uh, as you go, to venerate your own favourite icons of your patron saint around the church. I was very closely friendly with uh, a Greek Orthodox bishop in South London for three years of my life, and I spent quite a lot of uh, that time um, when I could do so, having performed my own liturgical duties, um, behind his icon screen. And, uh, I mean, the whole community was there. Greek churches don't only include the really rather pious 
they include, or he did then, the whole community. I mean, the neighbourhood, this was South London, it was the Cypriot Orthodox Church, the neighbourhood crooks were all there, and I'm sure as they stood behind one of the pillars, chattering away, they were probably, well, let us not go into what they might have been uh, setting up or organising. And people broke off to leave the church from time to time for smoke and then come back. That's not unknown to the Irish, is it? When I, was, when I used to look after a couple of Church of Ireland churches in, in County Kerry in the summer months, and we had to drive from one of them to the other, we passed several Catholic churches, and there seemed to be lots of uh, devout men standing outside the back door. Reverend Fathers, you may not be familiar with this because you're never outside the back door of the church um, while you're offering the holy sacrifice. <laughs> but I, I, I reckon you would have half a dozen to a dozen smokers gnashing together outside. Yeah. Well, that's one way of participating actively. I think that the Byzantine way, to us, incredibly relaxed way, they don't take part in any of the singing. They don't necessarily listen to the readings. If they did listen to the readings, I'm not sure how much they would understand because Koine Greek of the 1st, 2nd and 3rd centuries is not the same as modern Greek. It seems to me, however, Byzantine Orthodox worship, it seems to me to be very much an example of actuosa per participatio. In such liturgy, there are moments when things are pulled together, when the priest comes out of the royal doors and senses the icons of our Lord and our Blessed Lady on, on, on each side, and then senses the congregation in a semicircle and all bow as he senses them. There is the accepting of the grace of God in that sort of way, the accepting of the dignity of their Christian status symbolized by the sensing, and another thing, if they're going to be communicating, they have done actus a participatio. In another way, they have fasted beforehand because in the Byzantine churches, no, sorry, I have to say the Orthodox churches, in the Orthodox churches, the ancient, probably uh, almost apostolic rule of fasting communion has not been abolished as it has to all intents and purposes in the Latin church. But another thing, in many parts of the Orthodox world, the convention is that anybody who intends to communicate goes to confession before communion. That is another actuosa participatio in the mystery of what is being done at the Holy Eucharist. <laughs> If I may digress with another irrelevant anecdote, I was once talking to an Orthodox priest in an academic context, a sort of Orthodox priest who gets around to conferences and things, and he was saying, these Anglicans, they, uh, they're always asking if they can receive communion in Orthodox churches. They, they have a great desire to be affirmed by being admitted to communion in Orthodox churches. They don't ever... I've never once, he said, had an Anglican asking me if I would hear his confession. That sort of preparation, that part of participatio in, um, in the Eucharist action is not something that uh, uh, people always understand. But I would say that that remoter preparation for Eucharistic communion is very much what uh, is at the heart of actuosa participatio. John Henry Newman talked about actuosa participatio, although since he wrote before the 20th century, he did not know silly fellow that he was, that he was actuosa participatio that he was writing about. This is what he says about the Mass as he understood it in his day. <clears throat> 
There are little children there, and old men, and simple laborers, students in seminaries, priests preparing for mass, priests making their thanksgiving. There are innocent maidens, and there are penitents. But out of these many minds arises one Eucharistic hymn, and the great action is the measure and the scope of it. In other words, he describes the church life of his time, in which different people are in fact doing different things, but as part of a harmonious unity, as something which is actually truly wonderful. And, oh, my dear Bateman, he, he added, turning to him, you ask me whether this is not a formal, unreasonable service. It is wonderful, he cried, rising up. Quite wonderful. When will these good, dear people be enlightened? O sapientia, fortita, suaviterque, disponens omnia, o adona, o clavis, david, expectatio, gentium, veni ad salvandum nos, domine, Deus, noster. Now, at least... Newman goes on, there was no mistaking Willis. Bateman stared and was almost frightened at a burst of enthusiasm which he had far from been expecting. Why, Willis, he said, is it not true then? After all, what we've heard, that you were becoming dubious and shaky in your adherence to Romanism? He had been disabused of that particular misapprehension. And later on in the same book, uh, Newman writes, How wonderful that people call this worship formal and external. It seems to possess all classes, young and old, polished and vulgar, men and women indiscriminately. It is the working of, of one spirit, one spirit in all, making many one. Something of a Fair Verino yeah. on Newman's part. War, 1960s, Evelyn War. He did have the advantage of knowing all about modern jargon. Participate is the cant word, he says. You know what a disagreeable old curmudgeon Evelyn War was. He once had a piece of fan mail from a woman who had read his novels. It was a piece of fan mail saying how wonderful he was. And he put it into an envelope, addressed it back to her husband, and says, Sir, I think you should know that your wife has been making communications with men whom she, to whom she has not been introduced. Yours faithfully, evil in war. <laughs> Not a man for a giggle. Participate, the cant word, does not mean to make a row, as the Germans suppose. Could he have known Walter Casper, I wonder? Um, does not mean to make a row, as the Germans suppose. One participates in a work of art when one studies it with reverence and understanding. Yes, well, I don't know. Perhaps there on the one hand and on the other hand. But I do think that the way that, that Newman puts it takes a lot of beating. A final sort of academic point here. Um, enlightenment. The capital E Enlightenment. A movement in European intellectual history. Writers such as Joseph Ratzinger, our English Catholic theologian Aidan Nichols. Is Aidan Nichols much known? In, um, in, uh, do people read Aidan's books in Ireland? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. I mean, you have to work hard to keep up because he tends to write one every nine months, doesn't he? Ratzinger, Aidan Nichols talk about the Enlightenment as the root of the problem in modern Catholic liturgy, because the Enlightenment, so-called, gave birth to ideas such as that something should be easy, plain, and simple to understand. 
Something should have a simple linear progression in which A leads to B and B leads to C. There shouldn't be a lot of repetitions and going back and repeating yourself. Thus, an enlightenment view of liturgy is very unhappy if it finds you confessing your sins to God at one point in the liturgy, asking God's forgiveness, and then going on to do something, and then five minutes later, you're at it again, begging for God's forgiveness for your sins. No, I mean, sin is something you, you have a ritus penitentialis, don't you? You have a right of penitence, and that deals with the sin business. And having dealt with the sin business, then you can get on to happier and more joyful things. That's linear development. They don't like it. And that's, of course, why so many of the changes that were made after the Second Vatican Council were made. They were not mandated, of course. There is something in the doc in Sacrosanctum Concilium about repetitions, but it doesn't envisage the sort of wholesale massacre that went on. And I'm going to conclude by briefly introducing you to another Anglican scholar, because that's where I come from. Uh, an Anglican scholar who talks about the right way of doing liturgy and the wrong way of doing liturgy. And she doesn't like the um, enlightenment approach. In fact, in an important chapter of her book, she uh, discusses from the beginning to the end the Tridentine order of mass, which she thinks is a pretty ideal example of how liturgy should be. This is what she says. In rejecting the features of multiple repetition, complexity of genre, instability of the worship subject, and continued interruption of progress by renewed prayers of penitence, under the assumption that these were secular interpretations, they ironically perpetuated certain features of the truly secularizing modern epoch. For example, they imposed such anachronistic structural concepts as argument, linear order, segmentation, discrete stages, and the notion of new information outside linguistic redundancy or repetition on a text whose provenance and theological context is wholly oral and apophatic set within a passionate order of language which calls in order to be calling or in the hope of further calling and not for any other instrumental purpose. I'm not going to read any more of her because as you will have grasped, she's a rather dense writer. Um, I think uh, would-be intellectual clergy in England very often have Catherine Pickstock's book upon their shelves and uh, uh, you can tell from the marks that uh, They've got not much beyond the first ten pages. But what she's saying is that repetitions are a natural way of expressing. Can I finally give you a simple example of, of that? Domini non sum dino, sunt in tres sub tectum meum, sit tantum dic verbo et snabitur anima mea. In the old rite, that was said three times. In the modern rite, well, in fact, it was said six times, wasn't it? Priest and people. But anyway, in the new rite, it's said only once. Well, I don't know about you, but I think saying the thing three times helps me for the following rather simple reason. I am not an Enlightenment person who is focusing like a searchlight in the sky trying to pick out the German bomber. I am not focusing all the time on every single word I utter liturgically, either as a priest, are you, or as, as a layperson if I'm in the congregation. I, perhaps this is a shameful confession for a priest to make, but I have often found that perhaps the first time I've said that, 
Domine, non sum dinum, sed indre subtectum meum, etc. That uh, the devil had played his usual little trick of a little distraction, or I'd noticed something, or I'd just wondered whether there were going to be enough hosts in that cyborium, or something like that. All of a sudden, in the course of the second Domine known from Dinius, something jolts within me. I should be taking some interest in what I'm saying or hearing. And it's the third time that I actually say it with some degree of conviction and attention and with some sort of reliance upon the grace of God and some desire to look upon his holy face and to be made anew. <laughs>